Hello, my loves. Welcome to another episode of the Becoming You podcast. This week, I was asked to be a guest on somebody else's podcast. And the conversation was so powerful. I asked the other podcast creators permission and shared that episode on my own podcast. Now, I was interviewed by Nuha Omar, who is an incredible, high-achieving high school student. And she just recently launched a podcast all about hidden biases in the South Asian community. So what, what are the hidden biases that women face in, you know, if you are a Muslim or if you are a brown woman in the workplace, like what are some things that we personally face? And she asked some really incredible, powerful questions about mental health issues in the South Asian community. And I just had to bring this episode to you guys because I know that you're going to have a lot of powerful takeaways around the conversation that we had around what prevents us from getting mental health help within our communities. Why are so many of us so hesitant? What prevents us? Why is there so much stigma around getting mental health um, help? Now, coaching is very different from mental health. I realized that. But part of coaching, the type of coaching that I offer incorporates mental health so that we can all live to our fullest potential and overcome our self-imposed limitations and this gilded cage that we all tend to live in. We, far too many of us settle in life. That is because we are afraid to have the scary conversations, the very vulnerable, honest conversations. And that is exactly what me and Noah dig into in this episode. If you love this, let me know what you think. And don't forget to register for the 21 day Becoming Confident Challenge. We are going to blow the roof off your self-confidence. And I have an incredible value added bonus inside of this round that I did not offer in my last round. Trust me when I say you are going to want to sign up for this challenge because there is something that is incredibly invaluable that is going to compound your results even more. This is going to help you with the struggle of these are, I'm loving the content you're giving me, but I don't have any hands-on help. The value added bonus I'm giving you is hands-on help, my personal help. So there is a sneak peek right there for you as to the incredible offer that's waiting for you. But you do have to register and you do have to join the Voxer community group to qualify for this extra value added bonus. All right, listen to the episode, enjoy it, and then don't forget to register. Hello everyone and welcome back to Hidden Bias. Last time we talked about mixed race bias with Desiree Rose, so be sure to check that out. Our guest this week is Visa Shanmugam. She is a mindset empowerment coach for women to help show them their self-worth and capability in life. She was worse once working in finance, um, but she's found herself seeking a job that gave her passion in her life and was something that she felt proud of in what she was doing, which has drawn her to coaching. So I wanted to start out with a fun question. Um, I know you talk a lot about self-care and spending time with ourselves. So tell me something that gives you the joy and how you found uh, your how you found it on your quest for it. Yeah, so there are lots of things that bring me joy. One that comes right to the top of my head is playing the piano. That's something I decided to do for myself when the pandemic started. Um, I love dancing, but I don't do it as much as I would like. So, and that is just turning on Spotify to a soundtrack that I love and dancing to Tamil music, Bollywood music, and sometimes English music. Um, I also love cooking when I'm in the mood for it. And most of all, I love fashion and I love styling. Mm -hmm. So I... On the, on the days I am in the mood for it, like I will put together an amazing outfit or I'll put together an interesting outfit. And that's just one of the ways that I like bring joy into my life. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so I wanted to ask you now kind of talking about like some of your favorite things to do, um, kind of talking about your personal journey um, and how you became a mindset empowerment coach. Because I know like I talked about that a little bit in my introduction for you. Yeah, so I started out like most South Asians do. Um, I was the, the excellent like grade achiever in school. I did all the things that my mom and dad asked me to do, um, which was follow the rules, like keep your head down, study hard, get really good grades. 
And then it just led to the path that we all, most of us take, right? From high school to college to then I did my master's and I entered the corporate world. Um, around that time, I also got married and I started my family. So I, I have two boys and they were really, really young at the time. And I just woke up day after day after day with this incredible life that I'd built. I had this amazing career. I was making great money. I had a loving husband. I had two healthy kids. I had a house. Everything that you are told that you should have in order to create a good life. I had all of it. Mm -hmm. But I would wake up every morning and feel completely empty on the inside and incapable of enjoying the things that I had drawn into my life. And I felt a lot of shame, embarrassment, guilt. And just felt like I was the most awful person in the world that I couldn't appreciate all of this amazingness that I had in my life. Mm -hmm. And add to that, I was also diagnosed with a chronic illness um, at a very young age, about when I was 23. So I'd also been battling that chronic, you know, autoimmune disease for a very long time and living with those health issues. So all of it kind of just came together at one point and I just looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't like the reflection that was coming back at me. I didn't like how I looked. I didn't like my life. Um, and it was kind of a crisis point. And, you know, nothing ever happens chronologically in like a domino effect. Like it kind of, lots of things happen at simultaneously. Um, so first I went on the health journey of trying to figure out like things outside of traditional medicine, Western medicine. I started doing holistic approaches and I started seeing how like diet and nutrition could really change and affect the autoimmune disease that I had, which was mind blowing to me because that was the first time I felt empowered. Like I was taking my power back. Yeah. And then I was really unhappy in my career. So I just kind of quit this incredible job that I had out of the blue, which most people assumed I was so crazy to do. And I, I myself thought I was crazy to do. But at the time, I didn't know how else to get happy. So I did all of this supposedly crazy stuff, but looking back on it, it was all the things that deep down I knew wasn't right for me. And I was shedding all those things. Yeah. And so I personally hired a life coach to help me figure out my own life. And that was four months of just blowing up things in my life. Not, I don't mean like my marriage or anything, but really diving deep into the inner world of me and looking at what's making me so unhappy. I'd always assumed up until that point that what things outside my external environment was what was making me unhappy, like my job, whatever it might be, right? And when I started digging into it, my life coach, I actually realized it was my thoughts about myself that was making me so unhappy. It's the way I talked to myself, mm -hmm. what I believed my potentiality was, which wasn't much. Yes. Um, and I was just super hard on myself all the time. And up until that point, I had never been aware of it. So because I worked with a life coach and I brought about such incredible changes in my life, I, my career just evolved over time. I tried a couple of other businesses after I quit my corporate career that worked for about two to three years until finally I decided to become a life coach. Mm -hmm. So that's a really long winded story of how I came to do what I do. That's an amazing way to find your passion and understand like how something, how something wasn't working and how you were able to find something that does work well. And so can you talk about how you, so with like this, you talk about how you had so much like self talk within yourself. So can you talk about some specific challenges that you had um, throughout that journey or that you would like to mention if you haven't already mentioned, or was it that big like um, crisis within yourself that um, of you getting your new job? That's what caused it. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was one big specific event that made me wake up to my self-talk. Um, I just felt, you know, after school and college ended, I never really felt like I was very good at anything, mm -hmm. especially in my career. I found myself floundering, um, not feeling good enough compared to my colleagues and always feel like I was going to fail at work or I was going to get fired at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, now on hindsight, I realize that it's because I was so self-critical of myself. Like I was the first one to be the harshest critic before anyone else could do it for me. And it was a protective mechanism, which we all have. Um, but when I started working, I hired the life coach because I wanted to grow my business at the time. Yeah. And I knew from reading books and listening to podcasts and things like that, that 
it wasn't anything, the actions that I was taking that was affecting the results. It was really what was going on internally. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd gathered enough knowledge by that point to know that my external world is always being shaped by my internal world. And so she was kind of the catalyst I needed to help me do that work. Because oftentimes we know we have the knowledge. We're like, I know that something needs to change inside of me. That's a start. But then we don't have the tools. Yeah. And so the life coach really gave me the tools. And when I worked with her for four months, she would give me, you know, journaling prompts, meditative exercises, really deep, like introspective questions for me to think about. And each one was like turning over a stone and looking at myself and being like, oh, like I didn't know we shouldn't talk to ourselves this way. Like I didn't know that's what's causing the harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so talking about like your experiences with your own life coach, as you've become a life coach, do you feel like you were able to bring those practices into who you uh, talk to as well and how, who you help? And I was wondering if you wanted to share some success stories about your clients who you have worked with and how coaching has helped them. Yeah, absolutely. I've worked with many, many coaches, business coaches, virtual healers. Um, life coaches in my, you know, last six years, eight years of being on this internal healing journey. Mm -hmm. And of course you take away something from every coach that you work with. And I incorporate a lot of, you know, the tools that they have imparted within me, because mm -hmm. I believe that a coach is only as good as like, do you take your own lessons and take your own medicine that you're prescribing to your clients? Yes. Because otherwise you're out of alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the tools that I share, I've either been trained in, I've gone through courses, or it's personal practices that I have done that have really helped me that I know is going to help my client. So in terms of client successes, I can share some recent ones. I, I tend to work with a lot of, you know, women in their late 30s to like early 50s. Um, that's where the bulk of the majority of my clients are. And so a lot of them come to me with wanting to have a better relationship with their children. Mm -hmm. um, they, they love them deeply, but to look at like how they interact on a daily basis, you know, things are, things are fractured, things are not smooth. Yeah. And so they always come to me and they say, I want to rebuild this relationship where both of us feel respectful and heard and connected. So recently I just had a client, um, she has, you know, older boys, she has grandkids with one of them. And one of the relationship with one of our boys was really fractured. And today she just shared that they've had like a huge breakthrough mm -hmm. in how they're communicating and they're both had the intention to work together, to build a closer relationship. They've been not so close, but they've been both scared to acknowledge it and address it and then start to take action towards fixing it. And today she was like, oh my God, like he had a breakthrough. This is what he told me. Like, I cannot believe this is happening, you know? And then another one of my clients, for her, it was a real lack of self-confidence. She would overthink, um, like never speak up in a situation because she was terrified of how she would be interpreted. And her biggest fear was like, people won't like me. Yeah. You know, for her, that felt so scary. And recently she just shared that in her community, she took the lead for organizing an event and pulled off this incredible thing that three, two months ago, it would have been impossible for her to do. Because it required, you know, coordinating group chats and reminding people to show up for things and constantly like just being top of mind in like being visible, right? And she didn't want to be visible in the past. She was so terrified of what people would think of her. So in the past, she would have sent one text and if nobody responded, she would have been like, okay, well, I guess that's, that's it. Like, I'm not going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But now that we've done, you know, internal healing. She's like, no, this is really important to me. I'm going to rally and I'm going to get everyone together over this cause and make it happen. And she did. And she was so proud of herself. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm so sure like so many other people can like understand that and like get your hope and like get these practices, which would be really helpful. Um, so kind of moving on to like the Indian and Muslim um, communities and South As Asian communities, like do you feel like traditional culture and societal norms in these communities have affected the way mental health is perceived and addressed, especially in my generation and the ones above me? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there are so many systems and barriers that are in place that makes getting mental health um, help a challenge. So 
it's looked, there's a lot of stigma, not just in South Asian communities, but all communities in general to talk about mental health. Um, and until we can start talking about it openly and, and normalize, like getting healing for emotional health, right? Not just mental health, but emotional health, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Like there is a huge, um, I would say disadvantage in the South Asian community because of this idea of like, what will others think? Yes. That is rife in our culture. Yeah. Um, because what others think of us is us. That's yeah. the idea. Like yeah. if someone thinks that you are respectable and you have a great reputation, if others think of that, of you, then that means I can believe that about myself, okay. right? So what you think of yourself, we are told, should be shaped by what others think of you. Yeah. And in South Asian culture, we're also told that that is more important than what you think of yourself. Yeah. What your grandparents, your teachers, your relatives, your friends, your professors, like what they think of you is more important and should influence what you think about yourself. Yeah. Which is such a broken system because then you're constantly getting your self-worth and your self-image based on how others see you. Yeah. And that's a million different views. It's not a single view, right? It's like hundreds of, if you have a hundred people in your network, then your self-worth is being shaped by what 100 other people think of you, yeah. which is so complicated, which is never accurate. And it's overwhelming because now you're trying to impress a hundred people. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that particular thread or strand, if I can take it apart from the South Asian culture is what is like so harmful, um, for people. And I think, I think it's getting better in our yeah. culture a little bit because of social media, because of how easily accessible information is today. And because of people like me who are doing this work of yeah. publicizing it and normalizing it and talking about my struggles. I show up on social media every day talking about the struggles that I have gone through to get to where I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's because I want to normalize that struggling is normal, that yeah. self-doubt is normal. And it's normal, but it's also a solvable problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I hear so many like of my friends, their parents talking about sometimes um, from Indian community, sometimes not about how they don't believe that mental health is something that should be talked about. It's very much like in the hidden, more of the hidden side rather than brought upon, like brought out. And I think that talking to you, like that's something that really helped me understand. Like it's so frustrating to hear that just because of how it can be solved or how it could possibly so be solved because of these practices and because of thinking about your own mindset. So yeah. Um, so I guess kind of going back into Indian communities and yourself and your personal experiences in your childhood, have you experienced or did people around you experience a sort of disregard for their own human, uh, mental health? Absolutely. 100%. I can think of so many examples, um, of that happening. So I grew up in a, I grew up in India till I was 11. So we all lived as a joint family, which means I lived with my uncles, cousins, grandparents, and there weren't any overt mental health issues. Like I couldn't tell you that somebody was depressed or whatever in my family. Like everyone outwardly seemed very normal and functioning. Yeah. Um, but I also know that there were a lot of, um, fighting within the family over like finances and joint businesses that were run together. And I know personally that my dad was bullied by his brothers and he was belittled. Yeah. And to this day, my dad's in his sixties. And to this day, he is still scared of his brothers, mm -hmm. like scared as in how a seven-year-old boy might be scared of being, you know, physically pushed by his brothers. That kind of scared I'm talking about. Yeah. So. We wouldn't normally classify that as a mental health issue. That's just somebody who had brothers maybe that weren't so loving and kind. Yeah. But that is an emotional and a mental health issue. Because imagine living in fear, right, of any interaction that you're going to have with your brother, being intimidated by them and yeah. having past stuff come up 
every time you have a conversation with them on a subconscious and a conscious level. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody ever, my, my grandfather never said, Hey, that's bullying. Like, stop it. Right. Um, my grandparents traveled often and they weren't present parents. So I know my uncles and my dad were, were brought up by the help. Yeah. And I know that hurts. Like that leaves, that's trauma on some level. Yeah. But my dad has never addressed that outwardly. Like he talks about it, but he never actually goes a level deeper and says that really hurt. Yeah. You know, like I felt rejected or I felt unloved. So we keep things at a surface level because it's safe. Yeah. And people are just really, what it really boils down to is people are really scared of feelings and emotions. They're avoiding articulating what they are feeling at any given moment because they worry that if I give this a name, it's going to take over and I don't know, morph into something bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they believe if I just ignore it and sweep it under the rug and pretend everything is okay, it's going to go away. But in fact, the very opposite happens. The more you ignore something, the more it festers and the more it grows and gets bigger under the rug and it affects every single action in your life without you realizing it. It's an invisible thing that takes over. Yeah. Whereas when you name it and address it and face it, you then get the tools to feel it, heal it, release it. That's what I call it, right? You yeah. feel it, you heal it, you release it, and you get to rewrite the power that it has over you. Yeah. And do you feel like because a lot of these generations don't necessarily get these teachings um, and get these understandings of what mental health truly means, like it passes on to their children and like this unshared trauma or undealt with trauma will eventually put be put on their children for them to go on in this generational cycle? 100% yes. Trauma that is not healed will 100% be passed on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So let me give you like a really simple example. Um, so let's say like you have parents that made you feel constantly like you're not doing enough, like you're not good enough just because you don't get the grades that you should have, like you didn't get into the med school that you wanted to, whatever, right? Like they're doing the best that they can, right? It doesn't mean that they don't love you. Yeah. Their way of showing love is giving like very small constructive criticism all day long right? Mm -hmm. Kind of badgering you and they're putting slight pressure on you just for you to perform a little bit better, right? Yes. For the child, that trickles down as, I am not good enough. It's mm -hmm. very, and they want to be, they want to be earning love. They don't believe love is unconditional. Mm -hmm. They believe that in order to be noticed and loved more, I have to work really, really hard and meet the expectations of my parents, okay? And then this person goes on, the child becomes an adult. Now they have families of their own. Yeah. And now they get, they have, a, they have their own child. And this child is like a rebel, right? This child does not care what anyone thinks about her or him. Mm -hmm. And is just doing their own thing. Yeah. And now this one's child, who's now an adult, now starts doing the same thing to their child because one they don't understand that they're parenting from a place of fear. Yeah. All right. They're parenting from a place of, oh crap, like I want to have a child that's smart and capable. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, people are going to judge me as a bad parent. Yeah. And I can't get love if I'm not good enough as a parent. Yeah. That's the perspective that they're parenting from. So mm -hmm. then they pass that fear to their child and start instilling the belief that you're not good enough, that you are not, I can't fully love you the way you deserve until you work hard and get the grades that's going to please me. Yeah. Yeah. And so it just keeps repeating. Yeah. Until somebody in that generation wakes up and they go, you know what? Grades matter, but it's not my self-worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like my identity and my value in this world is not a product of my grades. And so I'm going to do the work of healing that wound that my mother or father passed on to me. Yeah. Because I think it's so important. Like, I think a lot of the times, like people wouldn't even know that this was happening to them because it was already so embedded into their generational cycle or into their trauma itself. And so like 
bringing about these conversations about mental health and bringing these conversations about awareness like you do is something that's so important to in order to change that um and so when you hear other people in my generation or in indian communities around you say that mental health isn't a problem or it's they're not willing to believe that mental health is an issue like how do you feel like that um or how do you feel about that um when people don't understand how important mental health is just as much as physical health it makes me really sad but that's out of my control like i am not here to convince anybody of anything yeah. i gave that i think a lot of us waste a lot of energy trying to convince people of stuff yeah um so what i now do is just laser focused on my work and mm -hmm. creating as much content as i can to change that narrative because when you come at someone and telling them you're wrong like this is what i'm saying is actually right nobody's going to listen. Everybody's defense mechanism goes up and you actually end up pushing them more into their corner as opposed to getting them closer to a middle line, mm -hmm. right? And change only comes about when people realize something for themselves and then they want that change. That is so much more powerful and effective. Yeah. So I just, yes, there are still people that probably deny that mental health is even a real thing. Those are not the people I'm trying to help. They're not ready. Yeah. So I just focus on what can I do today to show up in my business? Yeah. Like how consistent can I be? How committed can I be? Because then the message that I'm trying to put up there will reach the people who are on that cusp, who are yeah. right on that edge of like, do I, don't I? Do I go down this path and get help for myself or not? Those are really the people that I am, I can successfully help. Yeah. 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 So with that or for the people on the cusp do you believe that there is a possibility for south asian parents to have open and honest conversations with their children or vice versa about mental health and well-being and how do you think that should become across or how how do you think that that, that should come about i guess yeah i 100 percent believe that it's completely possible for south asian families to have very healthy emotional mental relationship within parent and yeah. child. Like I, I lead by example, you know, I have an almost teenager and I have a nine year old mm -hmm. and we have, there are some days where we're just goofy and they're just being kids. Yeah. And then there are some days where we have really deep, uncomfortable conversations, especially with my teenager. Like he's starting, to, he already knows what sex is and what, you know, gay relationships are and. He has some really difficult, quite awkward questions as a parent to answer, right? But because I've done my own inner work of feeling safe within who I am, I don't get petrified by those type of questions. A parent who's not healed, yeah. right? Who still feels shame around sex and haven't healed their own sexual trauma. A lot of South Asian families have sexual trauma. If I hadn't healed my own trauma around that, then I will not be able to answer those questions in a safe, loving way for my child. I'd be like, don't ask me those questions. That's totally wrong. You're not ready for that yet. Yeah. Right. And you'd shut it down. Yeah. And then, which then causes a child to feel shame. They're like, oh my God, I'm such a bad, terrible individual for even thinking about these things. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But instead, because I've done the work, like I can have age appropriate conversations with my child without freaking out myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with I, something that I've noticed um, throughout like being a teenager and living through this and seeing other people grow up and go into college is a lot of children who have had such strict parents about things like sex or things like other things that are somehow seen as like a stigma or a taboo in communities, they actually have the opposite reaction to it and they will not or sometimes it'll be harder for them to go into society and deal with these things because they've never experienced it and because it was something that was so taboo for them, which is why I think that open and honest conversations like you're talking about mean so much to, and should mean so much to everybody. Yeah. So, and, and I've had clients who worked with me who have gone from one end of the spectrum of like not knowing how to talk to their kids about anything without yelling, right? Yeah. To now creating a safe space for their kid to come to them with anything and, and learning how to accept their child for who they are instead of constantly trying to change them for who they're not. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a great thing to strive for for any parent. 
Um, so I wanted to ask, I know we like touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to ask, can do you can you share some examples of specific techniques or strategies you would use in your coaching sessions to help clients improve their mental well-being um, or help them be able to talk to their parents about this stuff? Yeah, so I mean, meditation, I know everyone rolls their eyes when you hear about meditation because it's, it's so talked about everywhere. But I think it's talked about so much because it is so highly effective. That is the easiest tool, the freest tool that we have to turn that light on inside of us. Yeah. All right. So even if it means starting with five minutes of just breathing and sitting quietly with your thoughts and your emotions, that is a start. Because unless you take the time to be still and silent, you don't know what's plaguing your mind and taking up and consuming the energy and the thought spaces in yeah. your head. Yeah. And so that's really important. Um, I give some of my clients a lot of journal prompts yeah. um, so that they can get all that clutter that's in their head into, onto paper. So <laughs> recently I ran a challenge and what I focus on is inner child healing work. So even if you're like a teenager or a 20 year old, you can still do the inner child healing because we're addressing and talking to the, the four year old in us, or the five year old in us that got, you know, bullied maybe or laughed at or mocked by someone. And we are kind of still holding on to that. It still yeah. hurts us. So one, one technique could be you write a love letter to the five year old you yeah. and tell her or him how much they mean to you and how much you love them just the way they are not not having to edify them in any way but to really write a love letter to yourself yes. it feels when you first hear it it feels so awkward right like how do you profess your love to yourself it feels awkward because that is a relationship that doesn't exist right now that's why it feels awkward because if i was to ask you to write a love letter to your best friend or your mom or your dad, like somebody who you loved dearly. Yes, it would be like, oh my God, that's so over the top, but okay, I'll do it, right? Because yeah. it comes easily to you. You can think of a million reasons why they're special and why they're so worthy of being loved. Yeah. But if you, to apply the same exercise to you, you're like, oh, like I can't do that. Like, I don't know what to put down. Yeah. It's not a sad thing that you can't come up with reasons why you should love on yourself. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the most powerful exercises I have. Another one is mirror work, where you talk to yourself in a kind and loving way while you're looking at yourself in the mirror. That's really powerful because to hold eye contact with yourself and tell yourself kind things is hard when you're always self-critical. Yes. It's like the walls come down and then your eyes start to leak and you're like, I don't deserve this. Like it feels a lot of people cry during this exercise. Yeah. Because they don't feel like they're deserving of these such kind, loving words. But that's that's good. The tears are good because that means something is breaking and coming down. A wall yeah. that you have put up against yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I would recommend self-exercises first. Like practice this on yourself first before you even start the conversation of mental health with your parents. Yeah. Right? Because oftentimes parents can be really resistant. Mm -hmm. um, because they believe that they have done something wrong, right? No parent wants to admit that they did a bad job with their kids. So when a child comes to them and they say, I need therapy or I need a coach or something, hopefully the parent is like emotionally balanced enough to go, you know what, this isn't about me, this is about you and I'm going to get you the help that you need. Yeah. But most parents in South Asian culture will make it about themselves and they'll go, what do you mean? Like, I do everything that I can for you. I provide for you. Like, why do you need the help? You know? And when you come up against that, it can be really hard to advocate for yourself. Yeah. But starting with these exercises is going to give you the grounding that you need to face that really difficult question and advocate for yourself and say, no, I need this to be well and, and well-rounded and happy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to like, even just have these conversations out in the world or like have people listening to both or you speak about this and understanding why it's so important to get this out and get the mental health professionals that you need or talk be able to talk to your parents. So 
thank you so much for um, being on the show and talking um, and at answering my questions uh, about mental health and especially its implicit bias in Indian communities. Yeah, this was so much fun. I could have talked for another 30 minutes easily, but thank you for <laughs> these great questions that made it so easy for me to chat. Thank you. I'm so glad. Okay. Well, that's all for Hidden Bias and thank you.